Tristane Academy of Magic is the foremost educational institution in the Tristane Kingdom, where aristocratic students can learn the art of magic and the four magical elements, earth, air, water, and fire. And no, I won't be doing the Avatar joke again. We've already done that. Now the Academy begins a new term, and Louise-Francois Leblanc de Valier prepares early in the morning to attend as a sophomore. In the classroom, Professor Chevreuse introduces herself as their Earth professor. To help the students further understand the principles of Earth magic, Professor Chevreuse teaches them a basic alchemy spell, turning three pebbles into brass. Looking around the class, the professor asks for one of the students to cast a spell. Professor Chevreuse spots Louise and has her come forward. The student's reaction is immediate. Everyone groans in disapproval, with one boy even asking the professor to pick someone else. Kirky Augusta Frederica von Anhalt Zerbst warns the professor that picking Louise is dangerous, so she should choose her instead. Hearing Kirky says this is the last straw for Louise, screaming that she'll do it. Louise points her wand at the pebbles and casts a spell. The stones glow and turn into a giant explosion. Rightfully, Louise is berated by her classmates. Little screw-ups like this are exactly why she earned the moniker Louise the Zero. Professor Chevreuse surely knows better now. After being reprimanded, Louise is approached by Kirky and her friends, reserved Charlotte Helen Orleon de Gallia, more commonly known as Tabitha, and sophisticated Montmorency Margarita Lafier de Montmorency. Kirky and Montmorency tease Louise, laughing at her incapability with magic. They taunt her about the upcoming familiar spirit summoning exam, prompting Louise to say she is confident in her summoning spell. Louise is determination is enough to make the two shut up. However, later that night, Louise wishes she didn't say what she said. The next morning, the sophomore class gathered at the school grounds for the familiar spirit summoning exam. This sacred ritual has students summoning their familiar spirit, a servant and protector that will assist their master in practicing magic. Kirby doesn't miss the opportunity in teasing Louise, much to the pink hair girl's annoyance. One after the other, the student mages summon their familiar under the supervision of Professor John Culber. The time finally comes for Louise to summon her familiar spirit. Honestly, guys, fingers crossed here. She confuses her classmates with her weird incantation. After one big expected explosion, Louise's familiar is revealed to be a male peasant. The guy wakes up bewildered and unable to understand the language spoken. Kirky leads the class in mocking Louise for summoning a peasant. Everyone else summoned a magical creature. Only Louise, the zero, can have a mere human as her familiar. Irritated by everyone laughing at her, Louise asks Professor Kober to let her summon another familiar spirit. But since this is a sacred ritual, each mage can only do it once. So Louise has no choice but to accept this peasant as her familiar or risk being expelled. To complete the ritual, Louise kisses the peasant and he soon feels a burning sensation. Runes soon appear on his hand and he faints. He's now Louise's familiar. Later that night, the familiar wakes up, thinking everything was just a dream, but of course, nope. It's not a dream, and Louise is right next to him, reluctantly accepting him as her familiar spirit. He demands to be sent home, but he stops as Louise removes her clothes to get changed. Louise throws the clothes to his face to have him wash them, but of course Saito can't understand. Annoyed by how noisy he is, Louise casts a silencing magic on him. One explosion later, Saito Hiraga is not silenced but can now understand Louise. The spell backfired most conveniently. Saito then gets to learn about the world he's in from Louise, but he has a hard time believing anything she says. Magic? Familiars? A cult must have abducted him. So Saito runs away the moment Louise isn't looking. On his way out, he sneaks past Guiche Chevalier de Gramont and first-year student Katie de la Lota. They notice Saito and the short interaction with Guiche makes the familiar think he's a dunce. Wasting no more time, Saito continues escaping. Louise soon arrives and demands Guiche help her catch the familiar. At the open field, Saito's escape is prevented by Guiche levitating him. Kirky soon joins them with her date in tow. With how absurd it is 
for a familiar spirit to flee its master, Kirky can't help but laugh at Louise. Again. Still floating, Saito notices two moons in the sky, and that's when it hit him. He is definitely in another world. Saito recounts to Louise how he arrived in their world. It was a regular day in Tokyo, Japan. He was thinking of getting a job after finding out how expensive laptop repairs would cost. Walking down the street, he saw a green, glowing portal. Saito pushed his finger into the portal and it somehow dragged him inside, and that was that. Now, Luis doesn't believe Saito comes from the world he calls Earth. How can there be another world? Saito doesn't want to believe it either. All he wants to do is to go home. But Luis says it's impossible because their contract as master and familiar spirit is absolute. They don't discuss it further, as Luis takes her clothes off to throw at Saito again. Luis climbs into bed after instructing Saito to wash her clothes. Saito tries to refuse, but Luis explains that as her familiar, chores like laundry are his job. And as long as Saito does his job, Luis will feed him. Before Saito can argue any further, Luis falls asleep. Poor Saito has no choice but to sleep on the floor still chained. The next morning, Saito pulls the covers to wake Louise, placing her clothes on top of her. Louise makes Saito do her bidding by threatening not to feed him. But after agreeing to take off his chains, she even gets Saito to dress her. As Louise removes the collar, Saito notices how she's cute when she's silent. In the dining hall, Louise and Saito are stared at as the odd pair they are. Saito is amazed by all the good food on the table. Unfortunately, as a peasant, Saito's place is on the floor with only bread as his breakfast. After breakfast, the sophomores have no class for the day. Their time is to be spent building relationships with their new familiars. Nearby, Kirky is tending to her familiar spirit, Flame. The fire-breathing salamander scares Saito at first, but Kirky assures him that Flame is obedient to its master and won't run away. This obvious jab makes Louise angry. Kirky even goes as far as to speculate Louise might have just grabbed the random peasant from the street. She then walks away with Flame, leaving and annoyed Louise. Now while walking towards Louise, Saito is jump scared by a bugbear familiar spirit. He bumps into Siesta, a maid working at the academy. Seeing the runes on his hand, Siesta recognizes him as Louise's familiar. She then explains to a confused Saito how aristocrats can use magic. Everyone else is a peasant. After introducing themselves, Gish calls on Siesta to bring his cake. Saito volunteers to take it instead, as he is very irritated by this snobby guy. At the table, Gish is chatting away with his girlfriend, Montmorency. His flattery is cut short by Montmorency bringing up a rumor that Gish is starting to date a freshman. But before the Casanova can refute this, Saito comes in to sprinkle some mischief into the conversation. The familiar says some damning things about what he saw Gish doing last night. His words are enough to make Montmorency suspicious of Gish's infidelity. Seeing the freshman, Katie approaches. Gish grabs Montmorency to avoid having the two girls meet. Katie runs into Saito, who promptly helps her locate her beloved Gish. At this point, having the two girls meet is inevitable. With Saito's meddling, Montmorency and Katie find out Gish has been two-timing. After a very well-deserved hard slap from Montmorency makes Gish a laughing stock. The Casanova directs his anger at Saito. Gish challenges him to a duel to teach the peasant some manners. Luis then finds out it's unbelievable that Saito accepts the duel. He has no chance of winning against an aristocrat. So Luis drags Saito to apologize to Gish. But Saito isn't having any of it. He's determined to see this duel through. A crowd has gathered at the vestry fields to witness the duel between an aristocrat and a peasant. Luis tries to stop Gish from going through with the fight to no avail. With a flick of his rose, a petal falls to the ground, summoning a bronze golem. A strong punch to the gut has Saito kneeling for from pain. Concerned, Luis runs to Saito to try and dissuade him from the continuing fight, but the familiar isn't ready to surrender to the snobby aristocrat. Instead, Saito goads Gish by saying his puppet is too weak, which only makes the blonde guy angrier. What is he doing? Meanwhile, at the headmaster's office, Professor Kolber reports his findings to Headmaster Osmond. According to his research, the runes at the back of Saito's hand appear only on legendary familiar spirits. Headmaster Master Osmond concludes this incident involves the lost fragment of the Pentagon. Regardless of the truth, all they discussed cannot leave the room. At Vestry Field, the duel continues. Saito has taken multiple hits, but he keeps standing up to fight, impressed but extremely concerned. Luis 
urges Saito to withdraw. However, even if his body hurts like crazy, Saito wants to keep fighting. Seeing Saito's strong resolve, Gish gives him a sword so the familiar spirit can have a fighting chance. But Louise warns him that accepting the blade will make Gish take the duel seriously. In desperation, she orders him to listen to her as his master. It doesn't work though. Saito doesn't care if he has to sleep on the floor and eat bad food. He'll do anything since he doesn't have a choice. But he sure won't kneel down and apologize if he doesn't want to. With that, Saito takes the sword and the crowd cheers him on. The runes at the back of his hand suddenly glow and all of his pain disappears. One sword slash is all it takes to destroy the golem. Everyone is shocked. Especially Gish, too, prompting the Casanova to summon not one, but six golems. Saito charges forward and brings down the golems two at a time. Stunned, Gish falls and admits defeat. Finally, an aristocrat has lost to a peasant. Huzzah! Hello, Kale! What a great day. After the runes stop glowing, Saito faints falling on top of Louise. Three days later, Saito wakes up all bandaged up. Siesta arrives to bring food. As per Louise's orders, and tells Saito how Louise barely slept so she could take care of him. Looking at his master's resting face, Saito can't help but think she looks cute when she's like this. The next morning, the fully recovered Saito is stuck on laundry duty. The clothes he needed to wash piled up while he was in coma. Even though he thanked her for taking care of him, Louise finds a way to be mean to the familiar spirit. After the loathsome chore, Saito gets dragged into class by Louise. Professor Chavruz gives a lecture on combining elements to create stronger and more diverse effects. The level of mages is determined by how many elements they can combine. Combining two is equivalent to the line level, three is triangle, and four makes a square. The professor assumes most of the class can use only one, but Kirky objects to this, saying one of them is incapable of using even one element. Everyone's eyes go straight to Louise, making Saito realize why Louise is called the Zero. In the hallway, Saito uses this newfound knowledge to mess with Louise. She has zero magical accuracies, but she's an aristocrat. Saito even comes up with a song to mock his master. The audacity of this familiar spirit to spout insults at his master makes Louise's blood boil. And with that, Louise declares that for every zero, Saito says, he won't get a meal. No exceptions whatsoever. Later that night, Saito's stomach growls. He tries to guilt Louise into feeding him, saying the master must take care of their familiar. It works, but only for a short time. Saito immediately incurs the wrath of his master after saying, like her magic, her bust size is zero. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Bullying is not gonna get you anywhere, guys. Now, on top of not getting any food, Saito will also be sleeping outside tonight. Fortunately, though, for Saito, CS spots him sleeping on the floor outside Louise's room. She takes him to the kitchen where Saito can finally eat his fill. The chef and the entire staff are fond of Saito, calling him our sword. That's because Saito beat the snobby aristocrat brat even though he's a peasant like them. And you could even say the chef is a little too fond of Saito after he tries to smooch the guy. After the hearty meal, Saito and Siesta go to the school grounds. Saito recalls how he thought he was done for the other day. In actuality, Siesta says Saito was in a very serious condition. He finally started getting better after Louise ordered a very expensive potion. Saito chalks this up to Louise having loads of money sitting around as an aristocrat. Before parting ways, Siesta tells Saito how she'd love to sit down and talk to him next time. Entering the dormitory, Saito blushes as he thinks of how nice Siesta is. He doesn't reach Louise's room as Flame, Kirky's familiar, lunges at him. Flame carries Saito to Kirky's room, where Saito comes face to face with Kirky herself. Wearing only her fancy unmentionables, Kirky strikes a pose to seduce Saito. Her words go over Saito's head though. It also doesn't help how they keep getting interrupted by Kirky's many aristocratic suitors. After Flame gets rid of the three aristocrats trying to enter Kirky's room, the Flame Mage is finally alone with Saito. She pins him to the floor, declaring her love for him. Saito tries to wriggle out of the situation. Go run, boy, run. But Kirky makes a solid case for her 
herself. Unlike Louise the Zero, she is just so much more. Now, Saito's eyes focus on Kirky's ample mamadadas, making him agree that they're unlike Louise's zero-ness. The flame mage moves to smooch Saito, but Louise's entrance interrupts their spicy moment. Aha! She orders Saito to come with her, which Kirky calls out as being tyrannical. Saito's still human, after all. With Kirky hugging Saito close, the familiar cannot help but agree that Louise is tyrannical. Saito finally steps out of it after Louise warns him that he'll be speared by over 10 aristocrats when tomorrow comes. Kirky sure has been busy. Now that they're back in Louise's room, Saito receives Louise's full wrath. Oh boy. His shenanigans have prompted Louise to bring out her horse whip. What? A horse whip? Girl, use an actual whip. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Before she can land any more strikes, Saito stops Louise to ask if she's jealous, but this only earns him a need to his jewels. For Louise, Saito can go out with anyone he wants, but just not Kirky. Their families have been enemies for generations. It'll be so humiliating for her familiar to be stolen away by them. Makes sense now. After the lecture, Saito recounts how he ended up in that situation in the first place. Louise says getting dragged by the flame is pathetic, especially since Saito's a swordsman. But in reality, the duel with Gish was the first time Saito ever held a sword. His affinity for swordsmanship gives Louise an idea. The next morning, Louise and Saito head to a nearby town on horseback. Gurki spots them, and since she's far from giving up on Saito, she follows them. Fortunately for her, Tabitha lets her borrow her familiar spirit, a blue dragon named Sylphid. Three hours of horseback later, Louise and Saito arrive at the town. Louise leads the way to the weaponsmith. The weaponsmith gives Louise a rapier to inspect, but she's not quite satisfied with it. She remembers Saito swinging a bigger sword. Ignoring the man's advice, Louise demands a bigger and broader sword. Her attitude irks the weaponsmith enough to try to rip her off. He gives Saito a sparkling golden broadsword, which costs 3,000 new gold. Louise is shocked by how expensive it is especially since she only brought a hundred new gold. For that amount, all the weaponsmith can give them is an old, rusty broadsword. While walking, Saito remarks how the sword looks like trash from a flea market. It can't be helped because Louise says she's short on money. That's when Saito remembers Siesta saying that Louise ordered a very expensive potion for him. This makes Saito understand Louise a bit better. Kirky and Tabitha watch them from afar, thinking Louise bought Saito a present to win his affection. So you can play it that game. So, using her charms, Kirky buys the golden broadsword for 500 new gold. In Louise's room, Kirky gives the sword to Saito, mocking Louise for being unable to buy the golden sword. The heated argument between Louise and Kirky escalates into a duel. Fortunately, Tabitha isn't having any of it, and she takes away their wands. So they resort to having Saito decide their argument over his sword. Knowing this isn't just about the sword, Saito plays it safe and chooses both. The girls stop at his face and continue arguing, declaring their hatred for one another. Their glaring match is interrupted by someone calling them idiotic women. Saito immediately denies it was him, and it turns out he is telling the truth, because the one who said that is the sword Louise bought. It's the intelligent sword, Durflinger. Amused by the talking sword, Saito chooses this over the golden broadsword. And with that, their argument over Saito's sword is settled, much to Kirky's dismay. Some weird accident brought Saito to another world and made him Louise's familiar. With no way back to his own world, Saito has to deal with it, for better or worse. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.